is a social TV podcast with Programme Manager for Developing Inclusive and Creative Economies at British Council, Kate Gardner, interviewing Fran Sanderson, Director of Arts Programmes and Investments for Nesta, the National Endowment of Science, Technology and the Arts, a UK-based innovation foundation. My name is Kate Gardner. I am a program manager with the British Council, and I have a particular interest in inclusive and creative economies, including social and creative enterprises and impact investment. And today, I have the privilege of being joined by Fran Sanderson. Um, Fran is the Director of Arts and Culture Investments and Programs at Nesta, which is a UK-based innovation foundation. And today, we are going to have a conversation about impact investment in the creative economy. Fran, thank you for joining me. Um, I'm not going to be able to do your bio any justice, so can you tell us a bit about yourself and some of the work that you've been involved in in the space? Uh, it's lovely to be here. Thanks, Kate. Uh, I started at Nesta in 2015, having come from the world of social investment. I'm not an artist or, um, or social entrepreneur myself, although I have the greatest respect for both of those um, categories of people. Uh, I came from the social investment space, like I said, and um, we were, Nesta had um, worked on setting up a art-focused uh, impact investment fund. Um, and a little bit about how that came about. I was working at Big Society Capital at the time, which is the UK's sort of wholesaler for social impact investment. I was doing a secondment to Esme Furban Foundation, and I worked on a proposal for this um, fund that was focused on the arts and culture, and that had come from a few different angles. There was Art Council England, who are um, the yeah, a public fund of the arts in England, who were thinking about how they might be able to make repayable finance available for some of the projects they were funding. Um, there was Esme, who were already trying to make social impact investments in the arts and creative space, but were just finding that they weren't really seeing the deal so they were hoping that if they sort of funded um, a bespoke lender for the sector they might be stimulating more um, sort of adoption of the comparable finance within arts and culture um, and then the um, Nesta themselves so that's you said uh, I'll give a brief account of Nesta which used to be a non-departmental public body um, but was spun off as an independent charity focusing on innovation for the social good and it's sort of, um, we, we call ourselves a, a kind of think and do tank. So there's a lot of research analysis and policy work, and there's also practical programs work and impact investment. And we've done quite a bit of work on um, innovation and funding for the arts and how, how uh, sustainable business models might be um, funded and stimulated to catalyze within that. And, and an impact investment fund is one of them. So Nesta put some of its own endowment towards the fund. Uh, at the same time, the Cabinet Office, um, in the UK had been thinking about what kind of structures could be used to pull together public funds with philanthropic and private funds. So they introduced this to Bank of America, who of course are a, a, a commercial entity, but also a big funder of the arts. Um, and, and all of those funders uh, joined together to make an impact investment fund of £7 million um, focused on England in the first instance. And then having worked on that through, ne uh, through my time at Esme, um, Nesta asked me to come and run the fund, uh, so I've been doing that for about five years, um, nearly, yeah, nearly six years now, actually. Wow, it's smart. That sounds um, a lot to get done yeah. in five years. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I mean, that was just the start of it, really. Uh, so since then, we've, we've fully invested that £7 million. We've raised another three and a half to make um, smaller loans. So we're seeing a lot of demand for loans under the, the lower bracket. The first fund could only make loans of, of more than £150,000. Um, so we worked with uh, another organisation, Access Foundation, which funds with Big Society Capital and the National Lottery Communities Fund um, to do subscale lending uh, in the social sector. So we have a fund doing that for £3.5 million. Pounds. And since then, uh, on the back of the full deployment of the Arts Impact Fund, we've raised a £23 million pounds fund, which we're now um, sort of uh, six months into a three-year investment period for that. Um, so we have definitely grown the business. Um, it's still quite an uphill struggle, I would still say, even though we have, um, you know, deployed a lot of capital. It's not, uh, it's not a tool that the arts automatically think of when they're wondering how to fund business development or, or impact development. So yeah. we've still got to, we've, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of, um, in terms of educating the sector as to the opportunity of impact investment. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think on that note, um, for the purposes of this conversation, I think a lot of our audience is going to come with quite varied knowledge about impact investment and the space in general. Um, and so maybe we can start with uh, just something really simple. For those who don't know, what, what is impact investment? So impact investment uh, is one of those terms that's probably been around about 15 years now. And uh, I'm sure you could find a whole wealth of, um, of descriptions. Uh, I like to think of it as impact, uh, as investment that isn't, um, you know, people might have heard of, of uh, terms like triple bottom line. So thinking about um, your environmental impact as well as your, uh, or your social impact as well as your um, financial return. So for me, it's about wanting to do more with your money than make just more money. So it's thinking about what are the real effects of that money and um, how do I measure the success of any investment I've made, you know, in a typical kind of linear um, sort of pure market capitalism model, you might say I've had this IRR over this time period, and that's how I um, that's how I I rank this investment. But uh, but all investors will know that that that's not you know with their own experience there will be um, other aspects and certainly private investments that have that have given them rewards, whether it's working with the um, whether they're a VC and it's working with the management and that's taught them something, whether it's brokering relationships. So it's just about being a bit more sophisticated about how you see the benefits of investment. Um, for us, we were looking at uh, artistic impact. So so what kind of, you know, um, artistic development and, and what kind of new art forms or how, how much are we advancing the art uh, in the investments we make um, and also social impact. So thinking about sort of, the effects in communities or individuals, um, a couple of organisations that we've funded, for example, are working with um, music in prisons or have worked with um, dance organisations helping to um, promote mobility and, and reduce falls in older people and that kind of thing. So it's, it's really tracing through and just having a, a bit more of a sophisticated look about what your money's doing um, and what you want it to do. And actually, in, in, you know, in the ideal case, it's about actively using that money. So, um, again, to use an example of ours, we funded a art centre in Hackney, which had, had had an informal relationship with a community youth organisation uh, facilities. Whilst um, they weren't, you know, because obviously a music venue you're going to have gigs mainly in the evening, um, so the facilities might be unused during the day. And um, informally, they had arrangements for the for, for kids, for sort of underprivileged kids, to come in and use that equipment. We said, well, if we're going to fund you, we want that to be a formal thing. We don't want that to be something you could sort of uh, take away at any time because our money is focused on the impact. So, so we formalised that relationship, and and that for me was a really exciting example of when you can actually use your money genuinely to um, to catalyse good in the world. So that's why I think it's it's really about rethinking the power of what investment capital can do, um, and it's and it's about kind of aligning as well. So it's not it's not a purely extractive um, investment. It's about it's about value creation along all kinds of axes, so financial as well as um, social, environmental, artistic. Great, thanks, Fran. So it's really around aligning your values as a funder with what you're looking to get out of it. And and I know that you've said that impact investment is quite a new space to look at funding the arts. Um, it's largely up until this point, I think, been grant funding. How does impact investment differ from grant funding? So with an impact, I mean, again, this is um, this will be a definitional question, and some people will talk about impact investment as as market return types of investments, but but with positive social impact as well. Um, there are other schools. Sometimes this is called concessionary impact investment, where you might talk to an investor about taking a part of their return, so having their financial return discounted by the other impact they're seeing. For me, I prefer to see it rather um, as a kind of, uh, I suppose. Uh, two-dimensional axis <laughs> I'm trying to think a plane rather than, mm. than a line um, so if you imagine that you know grant funding you're never going to get any of that money back so that if you think that's minus 100% and it may be that there are some impact, out, impact investments out there that could be just as, just as um, uh, impactful as a um, sorry just as you could get just as high return as a, as a pure financial play um, so but anywhere between that gap as long as you're creating a positive impact, um, you know, and, and you can see it as an investment in a way, but certainly if you're a foundation, you would otherwise be 
um, investing your money for for a minus 100 return. If you look at something and say, well, if I could just get 50% of this back in certain circumstances and we could create some structure where we're aligned, then actually I've got more of my grant capital to reinvest in other um, organizations. And so it's a win-win. So for me, it's, it's anything on that spectrum from minus 100 to commercial return. Um, and I think we can be wary as well of, of assuming that um, the, the lower the financial return, the higher the impact, because I don't think they are correlated in that way. So I think there can be a sort of reductivist way of looking at it where you say, oh, well, this one was with high return and low impact, and this one was low return, but I made a lot of impact. But there's also risk considerations um, and implementation to take into account there as well. Sure. So everything's kind of happening on the scale. So if you're thinking about ways of receiving or distributing money, on the one hand, you've got straight investment, which is considering a market-related return. And on the other, we have grants. And in between that, as you've said, there are a number of different options that could quantify impact investing. Yeah, exactly. Great. Very much more succinctly put than me. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so, Fran, let's move over to the creative economy. So, uh, the United Nations has declared 2021 the International Year of Creative Economy and Sustainable Development. So, that's a, a slightly surprising and, and new uh, correlation. So, what is the link between global sustainable development and culture and creativity? Well, I think it doesn't, you, you know, if you look at any society um, within the world and, and certainly one of the things that I it was really obvious to me when I took the job on the Arts Impact Fund is that, is that, that it's very rare to find art decoupled from social purpose there'll be community arts groups wherever you are art is about togetherness connecting it's about building relationships it's about creating empathy um, so for me it's, it's, it's very intrinsically linked the arts and social purpose and you'll get kind of different levels of explicitness in that um uh, there's also, you know, you might say that there's, at, at, at again, at extreme end of of, um, of a spectrum, there's very esoteric art that's all about advancing the art form. It's only going to be, um, you know, enjoyable to uh, a small audience of, of very um, well-informed people. And there, there is merit to that. To, to build on your point, so from your experience, if we go back to the impact investor, uh, from your experience of your fund in the UK, are you finding that uh, typical impact investors are considering the pursuit of that cu cultural intelligence, the pursuit of art making as impact in and of itself? Or are they looking for arts businesses that are having more traditional, ethical, responsible, sustainable practices that they're seeing in, for instance, uh, a food security social enterprise? I think that's a really interesting question. And there's a lot of work that's been done by um, someone we're, we're, we're collaborating closely with in, in New York about um, looking, really looking at the data on impact of investment to date and seeing, you know, it looks like the creative economy is very, very up, underrepresented. And it is. But a lot of those, um, a lot of those enterprises are actually looking elsewhere. So, so you might have something that is uh, an art studio that that's kind of, um, filed under community development as it were so um i think that i think that impact investment so far has been very outcome focused and that's right i think that the arts are an area where it's harder to define your outcomes or certainly if you are doing um explicit social purpose work it's unlikely that you've been outcome focused in the same way in terms of how you're doing your reporting and evaluation because um as opposed to something like you know an explicit health mission where you might be funded on outcomes, they might be funded on the number of eye surgeries done, for example. It's not been inherent in art practice in the same way to um, to record your outcomes. So I think that when impact investors start looking at this and start saying, okay, well, I, I want to be able to quantify yeah. this return, which is non-financial, that by its very nature becomes very outcome focused and the art um, not having a well-developed um, or, or a very kind of evolved way of looking at their impact, either social or artistic, might have been overlooked in that initial kind of wave of impact investment where people were very risk averse. At the same time, you've got an awful lot of um, high net worth philanthropists. You know, the, the, the history of patronage in the arts and um, philanthropy is, is well established across the globe. So I think that people are beginning to realise, well, look, I've been, I've been investing my money 
actually in this area for a long time and why do I do that? And what might those benefits be that I could also consider in my impact investment portfolio? So that probably sounds like a bit of a, um, a piecemeal answer. I think that uh, it is, I, I think it, it's evolving and then there's an opportunity to shape the way that people think about. Um, and I, I also, I think the thing I'll say here is that there's there's sort of a, um, quite often a uh, dichotomy or a sort of, uh, the arts are presented as, as having intrinsic value and instrumental value. Um, and I think that can be a slightly unhelpful distinction sometimes in that, um, you know, it seems like you're, you're one or the other. Mm. Um, but that's something we've seen a lot in in the reaction to the pandemic. And I think that, for example, there's lots of arts organisations in, in the UK who've pivoted really quickly and who've used their community position to be, for example, um, distributing food or connecting with people or ensuring there's no, uh, you know, that, that loneliness is minimised in the local community. Um, and it's really important to just, you know, to remember these are arts organisations as well. And whilst they do serve a brilliant social purpose, they, they, they're also creating work they're also supporting artists so it's um it's just being being mindful to be quite nuanced about how you look about the interplay between that intrinsic value and that instrumental value Mm, absolutely i think we're starting to see that with the arts businesses that we support through the british council there's there's a lot more willingness to start looking at those outcomes that can be documented and shared for these types of purposes but it's definitely something that's that's new and that people are getting their heads around and we're definitely seeing some resistance against um, the notion that art for the sake of art is not impactful enough and that we have to have these very hard figures around you know community consultation or community gathering or or something along those lines Um, and that's not always necessarily as you say helpful. I think coming back to some misconceptions. So I know you know that the the Global Impact Investing Network, GIN, produces an annual impact investing survey. And the 2020 report showed that 0.1% of global impact investment is going to arts and culture. I know you've hinted at this already, but is this indicating that businesses in the creative economy are a bad investment, either for impact or financially? I I don't think it's at all indicating that they're a bad investment i think it's indicating that they are um an invisible investment and it's difficult to find the opportunities and i think that that flows both ways um that's something that we're working really hard actually to 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 combat that that kind of or to or to build momentum and, and create some kind of critical mass about about the opportunities um for investors and for organizations alike um, I think it, I think there again there's a, there's a kind of a scale and distribution question. So um, there aren't it, you know with any kind of investment market it's it's quite a a, um, a tender dance between the flows the, the, the inflows and the investment opportunities. Um, and you know if you suddenly get a huge institutional investor um, interested in an area, then they're not going to be um, you know they might be quite disappointed if they're seeing lots of grassroots organisations who are you know practically impossible for them to invest in because the friction is too high for the for the weight of the money that's trying to move so it's 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 about matching those opportunities at the right level and that's always going to take um that's always going to be challenging especially in situations where you're not talking about high returns so you haven't or or you're not necessarily talking about high returns so you don't have that um you, you have less less kind of i suppose transaction room to play with um, I think that that actually, as as we look at, um, I think that I mean, if you look at the creative economy, it's growing faster uh, than the broader economy. So, so there are definitely opportunities there. I think there is that there are impact stories there that we need to capture. Um, and there's a real, you know, it's really there is something about that I've observed, and this is not going to sound very scientific, um, but I but I, I'm sure it will be recognised about the kind of um, uh, the connection of, of, of creativity and creative pursuit and um, sort of outward-looking, socially focused um, initiatives. So I think that there is, you know, there is a huge opportunity there. Um, and I think that that actually what the creative sector, the creative economy globally could do with patient, sympathetic capital that is um, not strictly profit-focused, uh, not, you know, being very... Um, linear and hardline and unnuanced and how it looks best. Um, 
I think there's there's enormous force of good there if we could if we can just find ways that 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 um that that investment can be structured and managed. So, I th- what I'm hearing you saying is that th- we just need a little bit more time, a little bit more track record, and some more understanding and as soon as people realize the rate at which the creative economy is growing and we've got more patient, more understanding capital suited to the particular markets, we're going to see a lot more money moving in that direction. And I know that you uh, refer to... The I think, fu- sorry, sorry I, just, I just want to say, no, I, I like being quite provocative here. I think we need a bit more imagination as well. So sure. I, I know that um, it's, uh, you know, track record and risk and, and these are the um, important things, but I think it's only going to take a few imaginative, uh, forward-thinking um, individuals to actually, you know, be be novel about how they express why and what they're doing, what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, to, to to create that movement. Sure. And to follow up on that, who do you mean by we? Do we expect existing impact investors to start pivoting and allocating part of their funds to the creative economy? Are we talking about people who are based in the creative economy and are starting to fundraise for these type of funds? Who who are you talking about specifically there that's going to be able to catalyze this change? I think it's I think it's everybody. So I think it's philanthropic foundations who are who are uh, you know as you know the world over are thinking about how to align their endowments with their missions. Um, and while they you know it, it's not a um, seismic um, in, ter- in terms of the velocity of, of the money or, or the the weight of money that is sat within philanthropic foundations, it, it you know it is quite small comparatively, but it does have a lot more freedom in terms of what it can do generally. So that's where innovation can really happen. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, and high net worth as well, I, I would count within that. Um, I think that, uh, yes, impact investors, so so institutionally people um, can get more. So, so of course you can do more with pooled capital because you can you can take more risk. So if we start thinking about what, what pooled capital could do, I think as well it's the organisation. So, so there's a big piece of education in terms of what, um, you know, so organisations constitute themselves in ways that can take on investment, understanding what it might mean. Certainly in the UK, it's really been historically very polarised. You know, you could either find uh, grant capital or you could find commercial investment, mm. and that has it, it even shaped how how our um, how our you know theatre sector functions, for example, and 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 what the distribution of, of benefits is for. Uh, how, how that distribution of benefits lands within the UK theatre sector. So it's really interesting, just you know, as a thought experiment, to think, well, what if we put a piece of, you know, a source of capital in the middle here? What was what was that? How does that incentivise our organisations? How does that incentivise our creatives? And that, for me, is the really exciting piece there. And that you need to, that's the kind of field of dreams. You need to, if you build it, they will come. Mm. If you have that pool of capital available, it'll be really exciting to see what happens and, and what this, um, that creates in terms of... Um, equity and distribution and how organizations constitute themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I know it's different um, in the UK, but I know in South Africa, when you're talking about either being able to access investment or grants, we still don't have and will, won't have uh, in the foreseeable future a legally registered entity that can accept both investment and grant. Um, and so grant going to nonprofits and and investment going into for-profit organizations. And so I think that the need for imagination stems deep into the policy level as well. Yeah, I completely agree. And we, we have a, a organization now called the Careful Interest Organization um, in the UK, but it's still it's very new. You know, it's, I think it's been incorporated for about 10 years, but there aren't that many. Um, and it, it is a long journey, but but you've got to create the, the tools and the incentives for, for people to go on it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and coming back to uh, your fund, we've spoken about the need for imagination and for track record. And so that's really where something like a catalytic fund like yours comes into play. Can you explain what a catalytic fund is and then how we are using these types of funds to help big organizations like the British Council, international NGOs to use their grant capital more imaginatively? Sure. So um, I guess I guess we would talk about our funds being catalytic in two ways so so the arts impact fund and its successor the arts and culture impact fund um each have a a uh catalytic layer within them so they're structured funds and they have different uh, risk rewards for each 
um, investor, but unlike a classic structured fund where the, the investor taking the most risk would have the most reward, it's slightly upside down capital structure, so that's the first lot each. Um, but you don't have, you know, there's there's no upside particularly because because we're making low cost loans, so there isn't really a lot of upside in the financial model. Um, that could of course be different with equity, but for those uh, grant holders, for so the people who've made the investment into the first loss grant, that's a benefit for them because they are, you know, core funders with in the sector for this, uh, you know, to use their money as an uh, as a um, as a catalyst to pull in, you know, leverage in another say 20 million pounds um they, they've then got five times the money working in the sector that they would have had alone and they get to um be part of you know the information gathering the it generation in terms of what that investment knowledge is yeah. so i think that's how that's catastrophic and, and and it enables them to bring in those investors um who would not otherwise find the risk profile attractive so it's really a part of kind of portfolio building and it's finding a market and an able it it enables us so one of the things that um has you, you know and we're obviously you know nested not for profit we're we're running this um these uh funds on a on a um sort of cost recovery basis so we don't make any money out of this um but one of the things that's been great about the way we've been set up is that when we were building the first fund we were able to say well let's the, you know, and this is a debt fund, so that, that's the way it works with the modelling. But we, we were able to work backwards from what we thought the market could tolerate, so what kind of interest rates we thought would, would get the deal flow, and then back out of that, what returns the investors would get, which wouldn't be the normal way. Mm-hmm. You would normally say, okay, what, what kind, what's our cost of equity, what's our cost of capital, and therefore what do we need to charge the market. So, so that's why I, I feel quite strongly that actually, you know, in order to create this market, um, investors, and because we're thinking about what, what non-financial returns and they get on capital, um, it can be helpful to say, you, you've just got to, you know, um, be a bit more bold here. You've got to take a risk and say, I'll put this capital here. We will allow the market to find itself and then we'll find what returns we get. So rather than being um, investor-led, you've always got to be a bit market-led. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for the international NGOs, it's not even necessarily being particularly bold because you were planning on deploying those grants anyway. And so it's just about yeah, restructuring exactly. your internal mechanisms to make sure that the money's still going out. You're still, if you if that's how you choose to be structured, you're still not getting anything back. It's exactly the same as you were operating before. You're just using the money yeah. differently and having different conversations around it. Yeah, and in fact, you may you may well get all the money back it's just about it's just about um, putting being prepared to put it up at risk sure. and and make that experiment. And if you can, you know, if you can find a market where actually, even if even if you've got seven percent of it back, yeah, that's um, that's a lot more than you were going to get otherwise. Exactly, and it's still benefit. Yeah, it's still seventy percent more than you were getting when you were just dis- distributing it as grants. Yeah, exactly. Um, Fran, I want to swivel us just to talk a little bit from the business perspective. I'm sure we've got some creative entrepreneurs listening, and I think they're wondering, how do I get involved? So from businesses, we are often hearing that there aren't enough funders or investors. And from investors, we're often hearing that there aren't enough investable businesses. From your experience with your fund, what are impact investors looking for from businesses in the creative economy? That's a great question. Um, so what we, I mean, what we, and I can, I can speak as a, as a debt investor. So what we're, we're looking for is, um, you know, is quite tight confidence limits around our money being returned. So we want to see a financial model that can show the generation of cash flows that will keep our money safe. That's what we need to show our investment committee. That's what they'll need to see along with the impact. Um, you know, we're, we're relatively risk averse. Um, because we because we get quite low returns, so so we'll be wanting to see a solid business plan. We want to see really good management. We want to see a track record in what you're trying to do. Um, uh, we 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 we'll generally spend sort of three months with organisations um, on the due diligence process, really making sure you know we'll write a kind of we're trying to cut them down for our full committee, but we'll generally write a sort of twenty thirty page memo that captures um, the impact analysis, the financial analysis. Um, really, you know, uh, in-depth um, in- interrogation of their proposal and what they're trying to do, the market gap, um, 
what other people might have done that that, that has or hasn't worked in this in this area. Um, and for quite a lot of organisations, we, we tend not to say no. We're, we're more likely to say not yet, and sometimes that will mean that a particular opportunity goes by, but but they're already sort of step under when the next one comes along. Um, so so we work a lot with them on uh, internal financial management. And one of the things we found, which kind of goes back to our earlier point about about um, what the bigger implications of a funding market that that's polarised between grant capital and commercial capital, whatever the rationalisation of that is. Is that organisations just simply, it, you know, managing yourself as a grant recipient is very difficult, different to managing yourself as um, as uh, a, an invested or an investable mm. organisation. You, you're different in the way you report things. You're different in the way you think about your money. You're different in the way you think about time scales. Um, you know, often with a grant, you've got, you know, you've got to spend it by a certain time. We see that in, you know, we see that in Nestor in our in a kind of annualised um, budget. Uh, so it's a really, it, it's a genuinely different way of thinking. And we found often, um, and, and maybe this is what the organisations say to us, that, that that's really liberating for them. And sometimes that's why they're coming to us for repairable finance, because they want to invest in themselves and their own income stream. So they're not thinking, you know, only up to the next grant funding cycle. Um, so, it, so, it, so it can be, again, quite a long journey, um, really understanding what the, the mindset shift within your organisation has to be to manage yourself as... Um, as an organisation rather than as a sort of um, money spending entity. <laughs> sure. Sure. Is it so, realistic uh, for... Uh, so is it re- realistic for a, for an arts business that is looking to become an investable business to use grant funding, which is maybe less risk averse, to start setting up those financial models and a bit of a track record so that when they start to approach investors, they've already got something to show you? Yeah, definitely, definitely, and and we actually often find that um, it, you know, it's the the organisations who have re- who are really really well governed by their board, whose boards have really tight holds on the organisation and are already demanding, um, you know, a good level of, of 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 reporting, but also within that of of kind of business intelligence. So rather than just saying, um, what are the flows for this? There'll be some analysis beneath that, so they'll be like, "Okay, what are the flows for this? But what would this have cost you if you had allocated your overheads to it? And how are you paying for your CEO with all of these, um, you know, piece of projects that you're putting together? And does that make sense?" So, so when you've got boards who ask those questions, you generally have you'll be much more investment ready um, than an organisation who isn't. Sure, I think. Um, but if you, so, so I think it's, there, there's a governance question as well. It's about kind of inviting that level of scrutiny. And, um, and governance into the organisation. But yes, to, to the extent you can get support on those kind of things, uh, on, on thinking about um, the organisation in that way, of course, definitely. And I think there's, there's a huge opportunity for everybody, again, very aligned in terms of investment capital for um, doing some work with organisations on that, on supporting them to, to, get that, to get that level of understanding and management within their organisation. Sure. So, so to build on that question of, of oversight of decisions and that governance link, what do you say to creative entrepreneurs who are worried about sort of the big money coming in and asserting influence over their business, but also creative decisions? Like how equitable are those partnerships? Well, that's an amazing question. That's obviously, happy, you know, that's been happening in the, in the commercial creative sectors for a really long time. And I think for a certain extent, to, to a certain extent, we're trying to be an answer to that because we are, you know, uh, and I can't speak, I can't speak for, for, for commercial creative investors and of course they need to be aligned as well with their, with their creatives. Um, but thinking about, you know, having the uh, ability to think beyond the profit cycle um, and think about the additional returns that you're getting alongside that and the, and the long-term um, benefits that you're accruing. Uh, I think, again, that's, that's where philosophically if you're if you're putting some more patient capital in between those two sources um ideally that will be a compromise and that will be that will be easier than um than taking pure commercial capital uh if you were able to but i think yeah i I think that certainly with um the organizations that we work with uh and again maybe they would say this stuff we've had really really positive feedback about the benefits that having you we're very relationship based um so we do have really, you know, 
cultivate relationships with our investees. Um, we've helped them, we introduce them to people, we try and introduce them to each other, we've got some networking. Um, and I think that it, it doesn't tend to be, you know, because we're quite high, um, uh, we're quite engaged as an investee, uh, I don't think the feeling is that there's that kind of, um, you know, control or, or strong power dynamic. I mean, ultimately, of course, we are the investor. Um, and we and we do have a certain degree of control by by dint of that and, and the legal documents that we sign. But we do um, we're very aware of that, and we're always in the first case um, trying to build a constructive relationship that works for both of us. And that will that will also come you know come out in the in the due diligence process. I don't think people would take on our investment if they weren't quite confident about that. But it, but again, that's you know as that um, proliferates through the world, that's about the market we build and how we consider um, long-term viability and, and long-term sort of uh, constructiveness in, in the investment market, I guess. Yeah, I think the point to put people's minds at ease there is that it's very intentionally built into the design of this fund to make sure that you're building those long-term relationships and that you are considering those power dynamics. And so it's, it's yeah. yeah, as you say, it's, it's not a purely commercial capital, it's very intentionally going to be relationship-based. And maybe that's the change that impact investing in the creative economy can bring to that sector. Certainly, that's, I mean, that, that is, that's really very much how, how I view it. Um, and I feel really positive about the potential for that. Absolutely. Great. Fran, I've got one more question for you, and then I think we're out of time. So do you have any advice for anybody in South Africa who's looking to launch or start fundraising for a similar fund to what you've done with Nesta in South Africa? Well, certainly get in touch. Um, I mean, one of the things that we've had, uh, one of the great privilege, privileges that I've had in this role is, is that we, we are sort of among the first um, globally that we've heard of, although actually we've heard of a, a few more recently um, who are doing this kind of thing. And it's been so interesting and so exciting to talk to people around the world. We've just launched a um, initiative, which you know, as you know, we're, we're um, partnering with the British Council on uh, to try and create a sort of um, central repository for for all of that learning and, and gather information and, and attract stories from around the world. So we're really keen to hear from anyone who is um, who's doing this kind of thing, anything that's around impact in the arts and um, funding nationally, regionally. Uh, because I think that we can all learn from each other, and it's, it's, I've learned so much from talking to people doing similar things in in, um, in different jurisdictions. And there, are, obviously, there are some bits which are um, which will translate, and some bits won't cross border. But but if we can start keep keep, keep the conversation going and, and learn which those are, then then I think that sharing the knowledge and um, and uh, making sure that, that we're sort <laughs> of optimised and efficient in the way that we're doing this, and we're not all making the mistakes, the same mistakes the world over. Um, on loop uh, yeah I think that could that, that so so first I would say get in touch um, second I would say you know really understand your market take the time to to work out the people that um, you're going to be investing in the opportunities that you have um, and, and who, who you might be able to partner with those would be my my top tips great and we'll make sure that we include your contact details in the show notes so people know how to get hold of you and share their stories Fantastic! Yeah, that'd be great. And if you if you have a look, if, if people have a look at the uh, creativity, culture, and capital website, they'll understand what I'm talking about. Creativity, culture, and capital <laughs> website. Great, Fran. Thank you yeah. so much for your insights today, and all the best for taking that fun global. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kate. It's been nice to talk to you. Great to talk to you. Cheers.